basis. You ever notice when I say jump, people ask how high? I'm going, oh no, I'm thinking this. Oh no, I'm, I'm in the middle of an egomania. He said, I'm going to tell you why. He said, because they know I love them more than they could ever love me. Hello, everyone. It's time for another episode of Martial Arts Radio, the show that brings you the amazing stories of the world's best martial artists. Today, we're talking to Hanchi Bruce Jutnik, and this is episode 120. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's top podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and founder of the company, Whistlekick. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. If you're new to the show or our great products, please have a look at our sparring boots. No toe strap to slip on, double reinforcement, extra ventilation, durable materials, and a comfortable design. If you're used to other foam sparring boots, you'll be shocked at how much better these are. Available in quite a few colors, you can find our gear at whistlekick.com or on Amazon. If you want the show notes, including photos and links to everything we talk about today with Hanchi Jutnik, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, please sign up. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of the Whistlekick websites. Hanchi Bruce Jutnik is a living encyclopedia. When you talk about the most famous martial artists, Joe Lewis, Robert Triez, Chuck Norris, Bill Wallace, James Matosi, he's right there in the mix. In some of the stories, he's on the fringes, but can tell you about the major players and what really happened. In others, he takes center stage and helps connect the dots on some of the most important elements of our past. It was an honor and pleasure to have him on the show, so please help me welcome him. Hanchi Jutnik, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing your stories and, and learning more about you. And certainly, I've, I've heard bits of your stories from others, and and you know you you know a lot of people, so I'm sure that we're going to have some names make some appearances in your stories. And I'm looking forward to all that. But we get started in pretty much the same way with every episode, with every guest, and we ask them. How did you get started in the martial arts? So how about you? How did you get started? You know what? I Sometimes I don't remember, but I, I uh, when I got started in martial arts, uh, martial arts were not, uh, not really available. As a matter of fact, most of the times if you entered into a school, you didn't have that many kids, for instance, in martial arts. And uh, I was actually pretty young uh, to be able to get going and, and start moving. A lot different than what it is today. And so I, I got started, uh, I, I was always, um, at that time, uh, I was dabbling, and didn't dabble, but I, I ended up making my living in music, and uh, the rest of the time what I was doing is uh, doing martial arts. I love to fight. I used to enjoy fighting. So I got in for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, so I look back at things now, and I think, boy, you are crazy. So, you know. <laughs> But that, that's that's why I mean you know I I love um, uh, the, the contesting of, of fighting and, and sport and and uh, just loved it. So that's 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 why I started with Tang Sudo Murakwan uh, from Tang Sudo. I went to Shotokan. Shotokan. I went to Kempo Karate. In Kempo Karate. I stayed for many years, and uh, from there I went. Uh, I studied. Uh, I got from 1973. Uh, for a period of about four to five years, uh, I was on a, a quest. I had a martial arts school at the time, and and uh, I would get up every morning about 3 a.m., drive down to San Francisco, and study from a guy named Kuo Lin Ying, and that was uh, Dai Chi in northern Shaolin. I left that class, watched the sun come up in Chinatown, and I went uh, and worked with a guy named Brendan Lai, and that was uh, northern Manus. Right from there, I drove to another part of San Francisco and stayed with a guy named George Longs, and that was White Crane. And I got introduced to Filipino arts in 73 uh, by a uh, friend of mine, oh, not a friend, but somebody who came up with the arts with me. His name was Pascal Fidel, 
and he happened to be the first cousin of Danny and Asano. And Danny uh, introduced us to Philippine arts. Danny had started probably about six, seven months prior to my, my starting and studied with Angel Kabbalah. So I would come all the way back from San Francisco. Oh, this one guy. Same time when I was in the Bay Area, I was working with a guy named Professor Mackey on Hungarian saber fight. Went back to my school, Sacramento, drove all the way up to Stockton, and had a class in uh, Salate Escrima under Angel Kabbalah. So it, it's been a journey. Yeah. So I mean, it sounds like you were a pretty busy man with, with all of your training. I, yes. I loved, uh, like I said, I loved to compete. I got into Chinese arts. Uh, after seeing, you know, a couple of people with a tournament, the guy that got me really wanting to do the Chinese arts was George Longs. He, uh, he would actually, the white crane practitioners of his would compete in tournaments. And the karate tournaments, I was, I was watching this. I, I'll never forget the one I saw. It was in uh, San Francisco. And white crane guys came out. They fought the karate. And, uh, of course, they didn't score any points because all the judges were saying no power. But I'm watching these karate limp out of the ring. Uh, these guys hit with the whole form. I thought, you know, I, I need to try this. So I went. Quo, when I was with Quo, now at that time period, uh, the Chinese really didn't want to open up to Caucasians that much. And uh, matter of fact, Sifu Kuo told me he wasn't going to teach me to fight. He just taught me forms. So I worked the uh, Chen Stella Tai Chi with him in Northern uh, Shaolin. But George Longs, he was a fighter. And his guy, that, that was punishment. And uh, I enjoyed it. So, yeah, I, I was a nut, you know, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. No, nothing wrong with that. Something that certainly a lot of our previous guests have said, maybe in those words too at times, something I can relate to. Probably a lot of them you've talked to, we probably, if I've talked to them, we probably would all admit we were all a little bit crazy. But I, I think I, it I takes a certain, before. absolutely. I think it takes a little bit of crazy to do what we do, to get out. And, and someone said this just on an episode recently that, you know, we get out there with complete strangers and we trust them to not hurt us. Uh -huh. And that, I think that takes an element of, of crazy. You know, we don't do that anywhere else in the world. Well, so. actually, actually, when I started, it was kind of like uh, I, I, I would feel guilty if I walked out of my class without bruised ribs or half feet to death. Matter of fact, I, I've, I've got an opportunity. I get to work with one of my first temple teachers. I go to Texas here now in a little bit and he now wants to study uh with me and under me and i hadn't seen him in years and i told him as i said mike i said listen when i see you in texas i'm gonna sue you he said, why i just dude you hurt me a lot he said <laughs> he goes he goes i don't remember any of that I said, of course you don't because you hurt everybody and so um it, it, it was a whole different world you know uh it's different now i mean uh it's not the thing, but it is what it is. So some of these old guys, that, that's why what you're doing is a real good thing. You're, you're asking questions and you're asking some, some seniors of the arts and uh, that information is important for the youth to, to grab onto and understand that, hey, some of these people did things that maybe they hadn't done or other people haven't. And that's what really made a lot of these people is that, that rough time. Yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, there aren't a whole lot of pursuits where we get to talk to, maybe not the earliest founders, but that second generation. And certainly, the, you know, there's still plenty of first generation martial artists in the United States that we've had on, you know, folks such as yourself who can connect so many dots. And I think that that's not only important, but a lot of fun. You know, there aren't a lot of other things out there if, if someone's passionate about shooting. You know, you're not going to be able to go back and talk to Samuel Colt or anyone that did uh, when he was making his weapons, you know, or, or any other passion right. that you have. And, and I think that there's an obligation for us as martial artists, because sure. we have that opportunity to hold on to that history as long as we can. Sure. Oh, no, no, exactly. Exactly. And that, that information, that is why it's very important for uh, people entering the arts to pay attention to who you, who's around you and learn to sit down and ask questions. Because if you don't, 
you know, that individual that you want to talk to might walk by and have these other problems too. Some of these seniors, and I'm going to bring somebody's name up. Some of these seniors don't realize that what they did was really a contribution to the arts. And uh, sometimes they, you know, they go, oh, well, that, that was no big deal. I didn't do anything. Uh, and the person I'm talking about, and you know real well, that's Bill Wallace. Uh, every time I see uh, Mr. Wallace, I go, Bill, you need to record all of the fights that you had and, and what happened and how he said, no, nah, I don't think that's right. It's important because you, you walk a road at that time. You were able to walk a road. It was very, very uh, important for the youth today to understand it. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, and, and I think, I think he's, at least last time I saw uh, Mr. Wallace, he said, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, there's someone to go ahead and do this. I said, good, you need to. And he really does. He really does. He's a humble man. He's about as humble a man as I've ever met. And, yep. Yeah, and yeah. I think that, that the interesting part of that, you know, we've had a lot of accomplished, well-respected martial artists on this show. And most of them, the vast majority of them, are pretty humble. All right. It's you know, called age. If <laughs> you, you get older, it kind of humbles you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's, yeah. well, you it's know, I, humble like, you. Not, not all aged martial artists are humble. Yeah. Unfortunately, seems, unfortunately, right? that's true. Well, those, I, are I, ones that, those are ones that might not have grown up. Right. You know? And I think, I think that that's it. I think that. My my theory, and I think we've posed this on the show before, my theory is that those that have been able to really accomplish something and and kind mm -hmm. of do their personal work through that, I mean, right. you know, everyone knows Bill Wallace accomplished incredible things and continues to. There, he doesn't have to pin his ego on on his rank or, or his name or anything because he, he knows what he's done. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's like uh, one reason my gathering is uh, is kind of important is because I yeah, I got a lot of guys coming out this year that uh, I explain to people all the time. Listen, man, you, you, mm -hmm. if you're going to sit down and talk to somebody, you need to talk to these guys. You need to pay attention, and um, my my particular students do, uh, but they don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, and I tell them, I say, look, I said, you know what? They, there's a gentleman sitting right there. That's Ron Marchini. Now, Ron Marchini has probably beaten everybody in the tournament circuit in, in the yeah. early 70s, 80s, and so on. He's sitting right there, and I'll have somebody go, well, who's that? Uh, you need to go talk to him. And then who's going to be sitting at the same table is going to be that name, Rick Alamy. And Rick Alamy, hmm. um, and I go way back, and uh, uh we kind of helped pioneer some of the kickboxing in the United States. So when Norris started the uh, team competitions, this when the PKA uh, was was kind of out there, but it was a team thing. And later, no, not PK, WKA. And um, so uh, Alamany, something else, another guy, Dan Anderson's coming out to my event this year. He's uh, he, those those guys just sitting together and talking is going to be a trip. And I tell yeah. my guys, I say, you see those guys together? Get nosy. Open your ears <laughs> and listen. Right. And they'll talk to you. Uh, talking to a guy about Alamany, uh, one of his guys. I said, oh, yeah. I said, hey, Rick, Rick was a tough guy, man. And I remember Rick in my school one time, we, we suited up and I, I slipped a kick into Rick. I, I, you know, it was a headshot. Didn't make contact, but hit him. And he, he uh, I mean, I didn't hit him. And he looks at me and he gives me a big pirate grin. I thought, oh, my God. Sure enough, I felt his knuckles all the way through my ribs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, beautiful guy, man. Beautiful guy. Yeah, uh, yeah guy a legend. Yeah, you know, well, the guy that's bringing him out, I talked to two days ago. He, he met me. Uh, this is when a kickboxing was going. I had a team in Sacramento. He had one. He had the LA Stars. And um, uh, the guy that just started studying with me, I says, yeah, he says, do I know you? He says, no, no. Mr. Alame told me I should come to your school and, and, and work out and train. I said, okay. He'd like to fight. 
you know what this guy, how, and I, I named him Shark Boy. You know, you know how he used to practice his balance? Hmm. He would go out to the Ceylon Islands and feed the great whites in a kayak. Is that wow. crazy? Is that nuts? That's, that's, that's a whole other level of nuts. That's a whole breed, man. There's a whole bunch <laughs> of people in the arts that were like that. And I think if Wallace knew him, he'd probably be out in the kayak with him. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay, I'll, I'll shut up on that. <laughs> So obviously you've got a ton of stories. I mean, great oh, stories. And, and yeah. I mean, you just, just gave us some, some bits in there, but if somebody said, tell us your best one, like what, what oh, comes to mind as your best story? Oh, my meetings of certain people and certain teachers I had the advantage of studying with, uh, of course, uh, James Mitosi, uh, changed my, uh, my whole view of the arts. I would have quit if I wouldn't have met him. Really? Uh, <clears throat> oh Yeah. Oh God, yeah. He, he changed my whole my whole way of doing things, and uh, it was in a very difficult place. Uh, I was the last person to see Matosi alive. Uh, huge influence, and it started a. Uh, I spent years trying to save his life. Another person that was very instrumental in, in uh, who I consider one of my my mentors, and that was Robert Trias. Robert Trias was in charge of the USKA, United States Karate Association, which was the largest organization ever. At one time, it boasted 600,000 members. Wow. A lot of people don't know about that. As a matter of fact, Mr. Wallace, when a uh, little story, I'm going to stop talking about Bill. Uh, <clears throat> when Bill and I were talking, he was, uh, he was telling me about how he met Trias. He heard about Trias. Bill Wallace, a lot of people think he was a Taekwondo practitioner. He wasn't. He was short and real. And he um, studied under uh, Yuzu Shimabuku. And um, Bill wanted to he loved kicking. And so uh, he wanted to develop his hands, so he went down to see Trias in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, uh, Trias' uh, fighters, those guys are hard to beat, man. They don't move back. They stay right, they stay their ground, and they are fighters. And um, Trias, uh, so anyway, Wallace would go down there, and how he was making his living was delivering ice. While he could go down to Trias' dojo and, and work out. Uh, Trias is who I consider today his top guy, uh, and Bob Bowles. Uh, <clears throat> he's out of Indiana now. Uh, Bowles and I were talking a little bit about Wallace. I said, well, what do you think? He said, oh, Bruce, he says, this guy, we, you know, Bill shows up. He had, uh, you know, he's all, all into his kicking. So we, meaning the trio guys, he said, we wanted to teach him a lesson. We didn't beat the crap out of him, but, uh, you know, show him, show him what, uh, what we do. And I said, well, how'd it work? He says, you know what? That guy could kick. <laughs> <laughs> he says, he could kick, man. So, you know, there's a, the reason I'm bringing that up is uh, because there's a mutual respect and love for different practitioners that, are, that have uh, been through things. And, and you don't see the, the ego going nuts. These guys actually, it's a brotherhood. And that's kind of, but Trias, Trias, phenomenal. Um, one of my favorite stories about Robert Trias was, um, he, uh, one time, I went to his, uh, he had a, USK had a uh, international black belt seminar once a year. It was held in the Phoenix. So it was about 600 black belts at it. And I show up, <clears throat> and uh, Tria says to me, a whole bunch of things happened, but he, he comes up, he says, Bruce, I'm going to have lunch with you. I said, okay. So I, he takes me out because he knew of my dedication to me, Tulsi, and a lot of people don't know this about Tria, but Trias was the very first guy to work for Matosi in, in Hawaii. Before Chow, before Young, before any of these guys. I did not know that. Mm. But Trias sat there and he gave me a lecture. He said, you know, Bruce, because he knew where, where I was going, he says, I want to give you some advice on running an organization. And I'm going, okay. He says, you ever notice when I say jump, people ask how high? I'm going, oh, no. I'm thinking this. Oh, no, I'm, I'm in the middle of an egomaniac. The next one, he said, I'm going to tell you why. 
You see, because they know I love them more than they could ever love me. And I went, wow. He says, you got to remember this. When it comes to respect, you don't demand it. You earn it. You do that through, you use the word love. And Trias was a powerful guy. He was, he was, a, he was a, also, he was a character. But I, I listened to this guy. Then he's the one that got me going on really knowing the importance of history. We talked history of the martial arts. And that guy probably knew every single bit about everybody in the arts at the time. And I'm thinking, wow. And he spoke many languages formally. Mm. I mean, man, there's something to be. I mean, you can be a fighter, but you've got to have some intellect going with it. And so that was one. And another one, Thomas Young, who was Mitosi's top student in Hawaii. Uh, Mitosi turned things over to me. And she is the one that says, Bruce, go see Thomas Young. So I did. I went to Hawaii. And Young was probably what every person would want to grow up and be like. Sweet, beautiful man. Here's one. Here's a real quick story about Young. One time, I, I kind of hung out with Young for probably about 11 years. And he calls me up. He says, Bruce, I want, to come, I want you to come to Hawaii. And uh, I'm going to show you how I train now. So what would you be thinking, Jeremy? You'd be going, oh, yeah, wow. Wow, this is yeah. cool, man. Wow. <laughs> let's do it. I flew all the way to Hawaii. You know what he did? He took me out ballroom dancing. <laughs> and I go, huh. And as I'm watching him, I'm going, I got it. If you ever look at a dance floor, you can have 150 people in a small area, all dancing. Not one of them will bump into each other. They blend. Mm -hmm. You get 150 martial artists on a small area. They're falling over all over each other. They don't blend. Now, the only difference between dancing and fighting is intent. For instance, I'm sure now, I don't know. I, the only reason I'm bringing up Bill Wallace is because you know, I'm sure Bill Wallace feels like he's just dancing when he's on the floor. And it's not a fight to him. And it's kind of that way with me. Now, if I had to change oil in a car, I'd end up with oil all over myself. Okay? And uh, so it, it's the intent. And that's what Young taught me. And one time I, I was, and I won't bring this up about what in the video, but I, I go back to Hawaii a lot. I just I went back last year. And um, around all the seniors. And I was asking seniors, I said, well, if you had, uh, I'm going back to Kempo in, in the 1940s, if you had Thomas Young and he had to fight this individual, who's really well known, tough guy, who would have won? You know what they all say? Thomas Young. I'm thinking, yeah, how come nobody really pays attention to it? Nobody pays attention to gentleness. They only pay attention to anger. And if I can look at the news, same stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Thomas Young's memorial service, I'm the one who gave the eulogy. And what I said was true. I said, in this guy's 80 years of life, he never had an enemy. And that's true. But that, that's another influence. And my Filipino teacher, Remy Priestess, uh, I'm the one that got Remy kind of going all over the country. And um, uh, Remy was something else. He was another guy. He taught me a lot about strategies and how to deal with people. So it, it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride. It's been great. It's been great. <clears throat> yeah, I can go on and on and on, man. <laughs> and 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 I want you to. I want to go back for a second uh, and mm -hmm. talk about Robert Trias for a second. Um, mm -hmm. Early on, it was I think over a year ago we had Grandmaster Victor Moore on the show, mm -hmm. and and we got to hear a, a bit about Robert Trias <laughs> from his perspective and, and of course, plenty of other things. It's a great episode, episode 20. And anybody that has had the opportunity to speak with Grandmaster Moore knows that he is a, a passionate person who will tell you how he feels about uh -huh. anything. And, and, and I have a lot of respect for that. But one of the things that has kind of lined up for me after talking to him and, and, and just the research that I've done 
is that the caliber of students that came out from under Robert Trias seemed like they were all uh, a head above everyone else. They're machines. I mean, they were machines. And, and you spoke highly of him, his intellect and his skill. What, what was it about him and his training or teaching methods that made everybody <clears throat> so great? Well, okay. It, uh, he, he was uh, he was classically traditional. For instance, and I, I tell my guys this today. You see all these guys today. I'm a tenth degree. I'm a fifteenth degree. I'm this. I'm that. I'm this. I'm that. And you, you go, what? Like for instance, uh, uh, my title is a job description. I'm in charge of watering a tree. That's my work. That's nothing to do with a rank. It has to do with um, uh, how you how you work and what your obligations are to students and things. And Trias had that same love for people, but his training methods, man. Like I said, um, well, I, I remember one of uh, at that uh, international uh, seminar I went to. They lined up with a type of kumite, which is a pre-designated point spar, and where you actually point where you're going to hit. If you don't hit it. And you, you would not have done major damage to your opponent. The other guy gets a point. So mm. These guys are set. And when they move, they move. But they don't move back. They are machines. Um, a good friend of mine with the Trias organization is trying to get, come out to the gathering, Pete Rubino. Rubino knows. And those guys are tough. But that, that uh, some other thing I went to, they had this, the, the Kumite section. And I was lined up with a guy, uh, John Hutchcraft, and he hit me with a reverse punch, dude. And I'm I'm positive I was knocked out. I just didn't fall. <laughs> I just uh, I just went. Oh my god! I said this guy comes near me. I don't care what the rules are. I'm hitting him with everything I can. They they were machines. They were karate machines. And when you talk about Vic Moore, I knew Vic Moore uh, actually. A bunch of martial artists, we all stayed in at uh, one time a, a little dumpy place in Baltimore, probably where those riots were. And uh, Vic Moore, he was a fighter, man. See, when I knew Vic Moore, uh, well, I, I can't say anything. <laughs> he, was in, he was in really good shape. Not in good shape. Not so much now, but uh, Vic Moore was one of the trio's guys. Uh, they were all had their hands in within USK. Every good martial artist sought out USK. So I told all my guys, I said, you know what? If you're, uh, in those days, if you were a first degree black belt under Robert Trias, you probably put more sweat, blood, and tears into that first degree than most people today that are seven. And uh, we, they were machines. Or they are machines. So you see some of them. Uh, a lot of these guys, I mean, I'm I have a very close relationship to many of uh, Robert Trias' people. They're, they're, uh, and they're training methods. Uh, some of them are crazy. Uh, you know, Trias used to have a, uh, this I heard from Bob Bowles, he used to have, and so did uh, Dick Moore, matter of fact. Uh, Robert Trias, uh, in his, in his, at his house, because that's where the train was uh, in Phoenix, a lot of it, and uh, he used to have a pet baboon and he would stand on this. Uh, so he would put the baboon on one of the <laughs> shoulders and they would have to practice going in steps, you know, like they were doing a slide drill. And if they bumped, the baboon would hit him in the head. Trius <laughs> so, didn't mess around that. And he did huh. a lot of monkey world training. And so I, so I was asking Bob Bowles, I says, okay, so what happened to the monkey? He said, well, it got loose and killed the neighbor's uh, boxer. So they had to give it to the zoo. But and Vic Moore had, I think Vic Moore might have got his monkey idea from that. Yeah, but, I was thinking that as you were saying it, that, you know, he, he he's he's pretty, um, and I, I think I would be too. I mean, he's quite proud of teaching a monkey karate. Which... <laughs> oh, well, okay, here's one. Dick Moore, <laughs> Victor Moore, had taught that monkey how to bow. And Trias came out. I heard this from Bob Bowles. Trias came out to this tournament or whatever it was, and Moore has the monkey walk out the bow to him. 
So Trius bows to the monkey and he stands up. He says, I just bow to a damn monkey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's something else. Oh, something else. You know, the, 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 yeah, these guys, there are no more. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people in the jiu-jitsu world, there are no more. Uh, I, I've buried a lot of very close friends over the last few years yeah. that um, people aren't even aware of. You know, there's a lot of people don't know who Bruce Lee is. Um, in my in my gathering this year, I got Greg Lynn Lee coming out, who's the son of James Lee, who yep. was a guy that opened up the corn with uh, Bruce, and then uh, in, in Oakland, that's when all of the problems started between Chinatown and Bruce Lee. Ming yep. Lum, who uh, used to come to my gathering every year, he's passed away about three years ago now. Um, he was the one that. Uh, uh, escorted Bruce Lee into the apartment and fought Wong Jack Ma. He was the judge. And it was Ming's personality that Bruce used in the movie Under the Dragon. So all those guys that went out of my gathering had the opportunity to meet these guys. And they're icons. And we're losing them. So, yeah. You know. Well, that's why I'm, I'm happy we have this show. You know, that's why we're oh, trying yeah. to talk to everybody. Make sure we capture as much of this as we can. Uh, okay. So, what are you doing when you're not training or, or, or teaching? What are your passions outside of martial arts? <laughs> if you have time uh, for any. <laughs> I don't, I don't have that much time. I, you, you know, uh, you know, you, you wake up in the morning, that's martial arts. You do a day, that's martial arts. Um, you know, I, 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 my passion is, is, uh, I love the arts because I love, uh, what the arts how it can enhance people's lives and and uh, so I spend my time doing that and uh, I do a lot of traveling seminars and clinics and I meet a lot of people and have a lot of friends and, and um, if and no matter what we do in life if you can if you can do something with that life to work and enhance somebody else's it's all worthwhile and this has been my vehicle of doing that uh, God you know I I talk to people, uh, you know, and I go, oh, my God, I'm jealous. I talk to people, hey, would, would, would you do this weekend? Oh, I went fishing. I'm thinking, oh, God, I'd like to go fishing. I like to do a lot of different things. But there's no, uh, you know, you, get, you only have so many years in his life, and right now I've, I've got a good vehicle to uh, to reach out, and uh, that's what I enjoy. I, I love history. I'm a history buff. Man. I could sit down and... and talk to history, to practitioners, uh, left and right. And that one of my pet peeves is that if you are doing the martial arts and you don't look and study your history and where you came from and you don't see where the dots connect with other systems, you're missing the boat. And a lot of people do not care. Um, and it, it's a, I've got a, a Keep bringing up the gathering. On my gathering, I started on it. It's like a Hall of Fame. It's called the Wall of Legends. And mm -hmm. when you come out, you see these two big walls with pictures. I, think, I don't know how many we have to, probably about 200 now. And every year, I add five people. And they're all people. To get in my Hall of Fame, you have to be deceased. And I, every year, I will go through each one of those names and tell stories about every one of those people. Now, the thing is, they're not temple guys or Filipino guys in Indonesia at all. But now I, and I think I don't need a script. I look at them, I know who they are. A lot of them, a lot of them are, were friends. But if you can't, Trace is the one that did that to me. He's the one that made me understand, hey, that's important. You know, um, so... That history is what I want to do the best I can to make sure that people look at, study, and practice it. And some of the martial artists that are up on that wall, I mean, you know, they, they, we all have flaws. We all screw up. But we all are able to do good things. And they've all done good things because they've all accomplished and, and done things, you know, on the East Coast. Uh, there's a, one of the guys up on my wall, Michael B. Pasquale Sr. He did a lot of good. Really did. influenced a lot of people. His son is, is, sure. is doing things, but there's a lot of practitioners out there. 
A lot of guys, Ronald Duncan, there's so many of them. And um, and I, what I want to do is encourage practitioners that are within a style. You know, a style of martial arts can actually hinder your growth. Because what it'll do sometimes, uh, practitioners can get paranoid. Geez, well, maybe my stuff isn't as good as this guy. Or, well, why don't you learn something from him? You might pick up something, you know? It's all good. I encourage all my people. I say, you got the opportunity to learn something, get off your duff and go learn it. And don't don't compare notes, you know? So, yeah, you know, that's how I spend my time. I, I'm, uh, I'm a romantic. Uh, when it comes to the arts. Sounds kind of corny, but you know. No, not at all. It's it. it I it kind of lines up. It doesn't kind of it exactly lines up with my personal philosophy and with the philosophy of so many people that have been on this show. The idea that any one style is is right or absolute just doesn't resonate for me because if you go, if you know the history as, as you do infinitely better than I do, but if you go back to those very, very early days, all those pioneers, their styles developed out of putting together pieces from other people. Yeah, and they're all based on laws and principles. I mean, you, you know, sure. you, you look at the way to generate a kick. If you don't have uh, certain understandings of laws and principles of the body, guess what? Your kick isn't going to be as good. And you got the timing issue. You got you got distance. Uh, same thing with hand movement, hand technique. And, I, and unfortunately, a lot of times when I go places, I have to listen to this stuff. Now, oh, I'll tell you another thing. The one guy that is up on my wall, and I uh, showed a card. And um, I was uh, I taught a seminar alongside him. So I think Michael DiPasquale Jr. was there. Was that, I think that's the first time I met him. But this guy was uh, Shotokan, and I'm walking by. I got done doing my thing, and I stopped, and I looked. I went back, and I sat down. I watched his whole gig. And he came up, and he says, aren't you, uh, you watch me do this? Or did you see something wrong? I said, nope. His name was Lionel Worrell. He's gone now. And I said, Lionel, I'm enjoying the beauty of what you're doing. So all I'm teaching reverse punch. I said, yep. And you could split the air with that punch, my friend. And I had so much respect for that guy. It's one movement. And um, about, and then Lionel passed on. He was one of Nishiyama's top people. And then uh, about five, six, seven years ago, I walked into a Shotokan school. Uh, this is actually where I'm going to be in three weeks, not at his school, but another place. And I'll see this gentleman. Walked in, Shotokan. And I looked at him, and I says, hmm, you must know Lionel Royal. He says, how'd you know? He's my teacher. I says, dude, you got the imprint of his punch. That's mm. how. And you can see signatures in all these practitioners, you know? And so if you study your history and you know things like this, you can start appreciating you know, other things. But you got, if the martial art that you're learning cause you to have blinders you're not you're not whole i can look at anything any practitioner and no beauty when i see it and it doesn't matter what style doesn't matter what system because if it's sound if it has good principles it's good and usually the ones that have problems doing stuff because of ego that a good boy to the ego, man. You got to enjoy smelling the flowers. Now, I got to say, I might be a little bit prejudicial with music, but it's still made up <laughs> of the same, uh, same, um, you know, same chords. Uh, you know, you got so many keys on the piano, and, and that, that's what you do. Yeah. But now that, so my passion is, is the arts. I, I love the arts. Yeah. If... I mean, you've mentioned so many names, so many people, and I know that the list of people that you've trained with is so much longer even than oh, yeah. those you've mentioned. But if I asked you to pick out one or two that really, and, and let's take Robert Trias out because we, we've heard about him, yeah. but pick one or two that really changed the way you looked at martial arts, who would those be? You know, all of those guys that I talked about, uh, uh, Mito, see. Mikosi, definitely. 
uh, Mitosis is the one that saw, uh, made me see through uh, over inside the ego that I have. Uh, and, and he, he blew my mind. And, and also, what, what had happened to him? You know, I found myself trying to save his life. You know, you, you know where he passed on, right? I don't, if you could, if you could tell uh, us that. Well, well when, when I heard about Mitos, it was a student of mine, and I, was, I had a textbook called History, Traditions, and Karate by, uh, I, had, I had three schools of, by, by Bruce Haynes, and, and I said, well, this is where it all came from, this guy, his name is James Mitos, and he said, who? He says, Sensei, he's not dead. I said, what? I see him every day. I said, what? He's in Folsom Prison. I had to do the first three murder charge. And uh, I waited a little bit, and then uh, I told this guy, I said, listen, I, I want you to try and arrange me to have a meeting with him tell him I'd like to be him. And it started a journey for, like, from 1977 to 1981 when he died. And I would go out there sometimes uh, once a week, sometimes three times a week, sometimes more than that. And... Um, that changed a lot. So I walked out, and I'm expecting to see this. The, the, the crime was murder. And a student who committed the crime, but he ended up getting the worst punishment. And then I got myself involved in trying to help him because I had an attorney friend look at his, his situation. He said, Bruce, you got to get him out. He's not guilty. And it's a wild story, man. And I, I, I don't want to go through all of that, so I'll just keep this brief. But the first time I went out with him, I see I was a big, tough dude. Nobody would mess with me. Back then, my my philosophy was: if you see something you don't understand, kill it. That was how I thought. And he changed that. He changed that. First thing he did, I walked out and I expected to see this uh, hardened criminal. Instead, I see Yota walk out, the little shrivelled up Japanese guy. And first thing he did, he, he, uh, he had two settings there in Tolson that you go and you visit. And you don't talk to a cage. I had to listen to that one for so long. You know, you got the Cagney movies. Uh, yeah. You had a, uh, uh, like a cafeteria setting, you know, uh, you go out and visit these guys that come out. And the Tosi was loved by the warden and loved by everybody. And when I walked out to see him, I see this little shovel up guy come out. He looks at me, cocks his head, offers me a chair, and put took my hand to his forehead and says, I'm a humble man. And I went, wow. First thing he says to me, he says, you think you have fast hands? Because he, he obviously knew my background. Mm. I'm just thinking, because I went out there to see him to compare notes. He says, you're slow. You hit the wrong side of body. I'm like, huh? <laughs> and every day, I wrote a book on this. It's, it's out. Every day, I would go back to my school. I'm looking at my students, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. He told me, he said, everything you do, I, I probably can't cast it. Is, I'll, I'll use this term, el toro poo poo. <laughs> what? And he proved it to me. He proved it to me. And uh, he taught me conceptually. And I would go back to my uh, dojo, and, and the land, it just blew me away. But I got two lessons. One, he wasn't bitter. Two, he was humble. Now, people say, well, what would he have been like? I said, I don't know. I, I, I worked very hard to try to get him out. And a lot of it was a setup. And uh, it's my belief system. And I, I don't want to get too much in that. But um, he... Uh, he changed things, man. I wasn't the same person. I would have quit if I would have met him. Would have quit. And then I started my journey through an intrigue that contacted me. He knew about what was going on. The reason that is is because Tria started studying with Mitose or seeing Mitose before anybody in Hawaii. So he was a Navy man. And a lot of Trias kept track. He knew. And that's how uh, uh, we'll call him all sense of And I became very, very close. I had a lot of respect for what I was doing. You know, I went to a lot of controversy. And, uh, a lot of people were really uptight over uh, Tulsi because a lot of stuff was done 
It shouldn't have been done. And then he informed me on what the term tempo is. But that's not a style. It was never intended to be. And if you, you trace that term, you go back with the term, it's where most martial arts come from. Uh, which comes from a term called a Vajramukti, which is uh, uh, thunderbolt clenched fist of the Buddha. and has to do with the right and left, study of the physical and the spiritual self. Uh, it's not a style. And if you look at uh, Korean art, the term for tempo is kunbak. Indonesia is called kuntao. China is called chuanfa. And it deals with self-study. So then you have styles that come out. There's a special, that, that somebody specializes in this or in that, but it's all related. And I didn't know any of that. And so I'm walking around and he was explaining to me uh, the things and, and, and it blew my mind. I thought I was this big, tough Jose. And, and uh, the worst thing he, worst thing he ever did to me physically, uh, he asked me one time he hit him. Now everybody there knew him. And so, like I said, a lot of guards knew me because of, uh, I taught some of them. And there was right. one, one time he asked me, he says, you hit me. Hit me as hard as you can. And I'm going, uh, come on. I'm doing this one thinking. Like, you little shrimp. I'm going, well, yeah, <laughs> he's a big, tough dude. You know what he did to me? I went to hit him. And I tried. And the guard's watching this. He moved very slow, moved on tide grabbed my nipple, twisted it, pinched it, dropped me to my knees, slapped me on the head and said, you stupid. <laughs> now, if you would have punched me, I could have gone, oh, yeah, I, you know, da, 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 da. No, the dude pinched me. That made its impression. Okay? Yeah. And it showed me right there that, dude, you got some stuff to learn. And that started a lot more of my journey. And I started dissecting and studying all the different temple related arts because they all stem from his original teachings. But they just, a lot of them didn't, um, you know, it, it started me on a journey. Uh, everything from Anton Crookie to all my time is going to Hawaii, watching, uh, uh, meeting uh, all of the people that, uh, what's going on in Hawaii now. And a lot of the guys in Hawaii, some of them will seek me out to help them out with their history. Because they don't, they, you know, I, Hawaii's got such a mixed culture that a lot of times what happens, they lose the culture. So they don't understand it, you know. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, oh, no, he, he blew me away. And then uh, my time with Kabbalah and um, all the Eskrima guys and then Priestess. Priestess was, uh, maybe he was a gypsy. And uh, I see a lot of the guys that after Ramey and I didn't really split, but I just kind of had to work more with a temple, but uh, I probably started Philippine arts before a lot of these guys are considered seniors in Philippine arts now. And so I watched that, and Ramey taught me strategies. Ramey was a fighter. He was a fighter. And uh, one other thing, I had two teachers. I, I didn't figure this out until five years ago, Jim. I didn't figure this out until about five years ago. Two teachers were fighting I, I'm going to say indirectly over my attention. One was Ramey, and I was kind of, I, I helped Ramey get things started. Okay. And the other one was Mitosi. I go see Mitosi and say, Why do you do Philippine arts? Japanese, much better. <laughs> and Ramey would go, Bruce, you know that uh, Yamashida sent a whole regiment of troops in to defeat the Philippines, you know. And they never returned out of the jungles. So Ramey would teach me ways to try to defeat the Japanese. And Mitosi would teach me ways to try to defeat the Filipino. There's a, a, a drill I teach guys uh, with the octagon that kind of would screw up Filipino arts. But one day, about five years ago, I went, wait a minute. They were using me. <laughs> you know, to, to kind of fight each other. Now, they never got, you know, Mito, uh, Mitosi um, was probably a little bit more prejudicial than, say, Remy. Remy would, uh, see, Remy also knew how to play things. So don't, both those guys, they had a, a great thing. Uh, Remy taught me about the importance of uh, 
fighting. He says, when he was in the Philippines, he said, Bruce, you know, he told me a story of how he became number one in the Philippines. Because what had happened during that period of time, uh, Ferdinand Marcos was in charge. And uh, so it, if a lot of the top people in the Philippine arts, some of them were wealthy landowners. And the guy that had a big rep was a landowner. So Remy had gone there and wanted to fight this guy. And Remy was from a place called Negros Octagon and convinced the, the guy that he was a distant cousin. And he worked around the place and all that stuff. So one day this big tournament where all the dignitaries from Marcos and everybody else were there. And Ramey, somebody asked a friend if he could play with the other guy, play means fight. And so because the guy's cousin, he said, sure. So Ramey said, he said, I defeated him soundly, but then I lost on purpose. He said, because if you won, he had an army, he'd shoot you. So what he did, he defeated the guy and made an excuse and left town. And that's how he got noticed by the, uh, the Philippine Air Force, the military. Hmm. He did, so they all saw it, but the other guy didn't because he protected his ego. And he said, first, that's why it's always important to be number two, not number one. He said, why? He says, you're number one, number two will shoot you. And I'm going, you know, that makes a hell of a lot of sense because, and you see this in every walk of life, people uh, that are up there, people that, what happens if you have a football, everybody wants it, right? Yeah. So what's more advantageous to have a football or be in a stand eating peanuts? <laughs> you know? People always have their eyes on number one, never number two. That's, That's right. True. That's yeah. right. Yeah, well, anyway, they, they, you know, I got some of them. I got some of those stories. I'll tell you, there tons of them. Yeah, and these are these are great stories. These are awesome. Now you you mentioned that early on your your attitude towards the martial arts was a bit different than it is now. Oh, totally. And you know, certainly some of these names that you're talking about were big competitors. Was competition uh, a big piece of your training? Oh back yeah. Then? No, I I used to compete all the time. I I enjoyed competition for the sake of competition. Uh, uh, you know, any, any trophies I had, I looked just. I looked at them and I saw the little collecting dust. And so uh, in my head, I in a school tournament. So I used to just get those away. Didn't care. Um, oh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I hit the tournament circuit really hard. You know, I, I went to a lot of different tournaments, a lot of competition. Was successful sometimes, sometimes not. Um, you know, I was, I was more of a brawler than just a, a, a tournament fighter. But, uh, oh, yeah. Did a lot of competition. Awful lot. Yep, all and, the time. It was almost every week. Really? Yeah, we used to we used to go and uh, when we before a fight, you know, you got the energy drinks now. We would, we would eat a bunch of dedicated liver tablets, uh, suck on honey, and uh, uh, suck down a bottle of ginseng with a root and a whole bit. And boy, we got ourselves pumped out and go out and fight. And um, yeah. International, every time that took place in Long Beach, I would always go down. At that time, I had a motorcycle. I'd get on a motorcycle and go down. And, fight. and um, yeah, did a lot of it. Did a lot. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, more of my forte was probably into learning. And uh, I got a lot of fights. But, no, a lot of tournaments. I, I probably competed in about 120, 130 tournaments. Okay. That's, that's certainly quite a few. Any memorable matchups with anybody that you know might ring a bell for the audience? Uh, you know, I and I, I competed one time, and I I fought uh, with Jim Kelly. Yeah, I was I competing. I don't remember what happened. I was brown belt. Uh, who else? I know one time I was. And it was in Stockton. If I would have won. One or two more fights, I would have had to been paired off with Joe Lewis. <laughs> and, and I remember, did you ever see, you know, and it, it, Bill Wallace will agree with me on this, I think. Lewis had a sidekick in back this that was incredible. His sidekick was scary. Well, that's the reason I know yeah. that. Too. And that tournament was in Stockton. And I, I was, what year is that? 
can't remember. It was seventies. But I remember looking at, at, at Lewis and I kept thinking, Oh God, I hope I lose. Thank God I did. <laughs> so fortunately I never had that, that situation. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, it's it's funny that you know, as as amazing a kicker as Bill Wallace is. And the sidekick is is his kick. It's the kick that he used the majority yeah. of the time. He won most of his knockouts with it. Yeah. But when you when people talk about who had the best sidekick, it was Joe Lewis. And and I've oh, heard well, some stories well, even from from well, Terry Dow that well, who introduced well, you and I. You, you know what happened to Joe Lewis? I think is uh, when he when he got in the kickboxing world, and I think Wallace agrees with him. Lewis had a side stance. And you'd, you'd see him ripple. It was almost like a, a, a rocket getting ready to go off. And you'd actually see him ripple. And I remember, uh, I think it was that tournament. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to flash back. The one I was talking about. Uh, one person was, was trying to antagonize Joe Lewis. And there's one guy who's a Korean star, Byung Yu. And Byung Yu, I mean, they would get in. Lewis at that time, he had his. Uh, I mean, everybody had a tube of honey, you know. Because I remember Lewis was sucking down the honey. We were, we were all everybody was doing it. I'm sure Wallace probably did it. And um, Bill Yu was antagonizing. So I'm gonna break your nose, Lewis. I'm gonna break your nose. And Lewis just kind of looked at him, got out there on the floor. First shot came out. We think Lewis did. He broke Bill Yu's nose. <laughs> And the thing, the thing about then is when you had competition, if, if the judges were, the judges were this way, you know, the, the, the nose shot, all the judges didn't see it. <laughs> okay. Everybody else did. I, and I know it'd be on you talking. That's just the way life works, man. You don't sit there and bitch about it. And, um, but matter of Joe Lewis, man, that guy was a powerful, powerful dude. He was powerful, uh, uh, and I, I mean, he was a, he was like a, uh, yeah, look like a Greek god. Yeah, he was a scary dude. I'll tell you, uh, fighters that, that uh, uh, when when I competed that, that were in the vicinity. When I say vicinity, I'm talking about the ring or maybe the next ring. Um, I, I fought heavyweight. There was another fighter that really impressed me. His name was uh, uh, Ralph Castellanos. And he was a temple guy. And he's the one that made the spinning elbow famous. So say if some okay. guy was sweeping him to go in, he'd do a spinning elbow and pow. Uh, matter of fact, <laughs> Castellanos, I mean, it, was, it was one of my one of my first tournaments or second tournament, whatever. I, I had no idea who he was. And uh, the Sacramento tournament, Castle Wallace was there. I didn't know he was competing because he was in street clothes. And I'm walking by him. Now, this is when I was, was the old me. I, I, he bumps into me as we're walking. And I says, hey, watch it. He looks at me and gives me his grin. He had no teeth. He had his beard. It was beard. And I thought, huh. I walk off that night for grand championship. He's fighting. I, I, I can't. I can't remember if Bob Allegri or Ralph Allegri, the, the big guy, the two, the two of Norris's guys. And uh, Allegri hits Casuanos with a spinning back kick to the head. I mean, he didn't really pull stuff back then, not that much. Casuanos moved his head, looked at him, grinned, and beat the heck out of him. And they're fighting for grand champion. Now. I remember bumping into him, and I'm thinking, oh, Bruce, you dummy. <laughs> you know? and, uh, so you look at some of those guys uh, he's still around I'd love to get him out to my gathering uh, so the, these guys are they were all great great fighters man and um, you know, I'll bring up Bill again because I see I, I do this I, I, I see Wallace I'll, I'll try to probe him I says, okay Bill I says, in your opinion uh, I'll, okay I'll say it this way in my opinion, <laughs> if you compared the the hitting power of old school karate tournament fighters compared to like even the MMA fighters, the old school tournament fighters 
harder hitters. And the reason is no gloves. When they worked on a side kick or a back kick, they worked it a long time. Or a punch, they worked it a long time. And uh, the competition, I mean, you know, the, the, the standard back then was uh, you go into the body, go full contact. Nobody's going to know, right? You go to the head, try not to cause blood. And uh, that's, but, but they had to really work. And that type of sparring that I told you about, the Teresa guys, same thing. Ron Martini used to have a half box in his school. The floor is no mat. The floor was, uh, I'll never forget this. The floor was, uh, con- I didn't train with Ron's, but I knew some guys that worked with him. And, um, oh, my fighters, you say, well, something, who should we watch out for? I said, watch out. You see a USK guy? I thought for them. And I said, watch out for the guys who have broken noses. Why? They're Rimble Kai. They're Ron Marquis. They don't move back. And Ron had his half box where if you're competing with one of his fighters and your foot went beyond there, you could count on your head getting bounced off the concrete. And that's how rough those guys were. Good reverse punchers, man. They could punch. Mm. And, um, you know, so um, that, that's the thing about Lewis. I, I, I think the, when, when Joe went to a, a front stance and stuff, I think that took away that power of that sidekick. And because he, he lacked that launch. That launch right. was a scary sucker, right. man. That was scary. I mean, I remember watching Lewis fight before, and I was up in the stands one time watching, and I just went, oh, my God, I don't want to get in the way of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a bull coming at you. I mean, there, you, and, and it was so fast before you knew what it was there. Oh, yeah, and he took his time. He took his yeah. time, and it, he delivered it, man. He delivered it. Yeah, something else. And then, you know, of course, Bill Wallace was, a, was Fox. He was a Fox. You know, he, he knew how to work it. Mm. Uh, but he had a lot of great fighters back then. You had know, you know, Wallace, you had uh, Skipper Mullins, you had uh, uh, Fred Wren. You had a lot of great people back then. Uh, Louis Delgado, who was on the East Coast. Remember Delgado was a fighter, and he was a great fighter. And uh, he was go to a lot, of, a lot of people back then. And you know why? They were so good. They didn't have all these rules and regulations. You go to a tournament now, and you, you look at that stuff, you're like, what the heck? You know, I was asked to uh, judge at a tournament. Uh, I won't say where it was. And a little bit ago, and I said, no. I said, why? I said, I won't score any points. So this, this, you know. And, um, yep, yeah, it's just different. Different. Yeah. Right? yeah, it's definitely a different game than it was. Yep. For and sure. the problem is these guys that played the game, uh, you know, they're all getting too old. I remember, I remember uh, Bill and I were teaching in Texas once. And they said, you know, Bruce, he says, I'm so tired of, of this stuff. And sweat. He says, you know, I go someplace I want to teach, and all they want to do is spar me. So I'm 70 something years old. I don't want to spar anybody. It's about learning, you know, and he's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, everybody yeah. wants the coach to do all the playing in the football game. Right. Yeah. Anyway. So you're certainly a big ad- advocate for learning your history and, and certainly passionate about the martial arts. How about more of the cultural side, like the movies and whatever? Are you you at all a fan of martial arts films? Uh, <laughs> God. Um, do I, okay. and I, I'm, I'm now, I'm, uh, um, <laughs> I wonder where this is going. <laughs> when, when, when Norris came out with his movie, what was it called? God, what was his first movie he did? Cause it, this one, Norris had the LA stars. He was living, I, I want to say Torrance, California. I had a, a group up in Sacramento. I'd been down there to, so I, I ran the kickboxing group here. He ran one there. And Alamey ran here. What the heck is that movie? The first one he ever did. No, no, it was a breaker, breaker. He had a bit part in Enter the Dragon. No, 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 not that. No. But I didn't think. Enter the Dragon, everybody loved. 
uh, with this movie, it was so bad. It was so bad. And I remember calling and I left a message that you just cured me a martial art movie. So I'm going to go see a Western. <laughs> the acting was horrible. But, you know, um, uh, but uh, I, I used to watch, you know, a lot of Kung Fu movies, you know. We used to a lot of times go to Chinatown and watch some of it there. But, you know, looking at technique and stuff. But now, you know, uh, yeah, the movie industry is, is something awesome. And, uh, you know, and uh, I uh, brought up Rick Alamany one time. Uh, Rick Alamany <laughs> uh, had some of us go down and we're, he was doing a, a bit movie. It was a, it was a low-rated movie and some of us went down to try out for parts in it and uh you ever heard steve labani temple guy yeah i've heard that name uh, yeah well labani was uh labani's powerful man he, i mean he's prime he's a powerful guy i mean he you know he benched i don't know how many hundreds of pounds and uh the guy that was in charge of the movie was james woods you know who he is right the actor i do yeah but this one james woods was on a on the low end of the scale of life. <laughs> he was trying to get his way up. And he was the one that was directing this movie. It was supposed to be based on like a rollerball movie. You know, so we were all trying out for bit parts. And I remember uh, as Woods was watching, so Labani said, hey, Bruce, I'm going to, I got an idea. I said, what? He said, what are my body trying to do? Now, I weighed a lot less then. And he picks me up over his head. I said, Steve, come on, man, put me down. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying for this movie. And then the budget went out of it. It turned out to be a karate. I didn't take any more part of it. I, I was just say, you know, it's too much. And um, it turned out to be a karate vampire movie. <laughs> I had no idea what had happened to it. But, oh, you know, oh, I'd love to see that. Oh, it, well, I never took part in a filming. Um, you know, I just went, eh. Like I said, that kind of stuff never, you know, that never of my stuff um you know you go down to la today you got to all the martial artists down there all they want to do is be movie actors and then the, if they, if those guys can shift their uh their thought a little bit more to where they come from you know that's the thing that drives me mad i go to martial arts school i says oh, you, you do that art i says yeah i, I says you know how you know anything about you says, oh yeah he says i do show the car i says well who'd you study from oh this one guy i'm going He's thinking, well, I don't know. I'm going, what? You know, that that's the stuff that provides me nuts. The Shotokan? It wasn't for Shotokan. Well, the, the guy that started tournaments was actually because Sanban Kumite was go, Gogi Yamaguchi of Japanese Goju. And that's called Sanban Kumite. But a lot of people don't know their history and they don't know where things come from. That, that's the thing that bugs me. If, if you're going to teach martial arts, have enough respect for the culture and enough respect for the art, spend a little bit of time doing some research and some history and, and know it. And you will probably perform it better. You know what I'm saying? I do. Did you ever see, um, uh, you know, I'll probably make enemy. You ever see uh, Fox, Fox uh, television channel? You ever see Water's World? Waterworld, the uh, Kevin Costner movie. No, Water's World. It's uh, it's. Oh no, sorry. The guy goes on to interviews people. Who's the first? You know, we're talking college grads. Who's the first president of the United States? Abraham Lincoln. Oh right, right, right. This thing, yeah. I like. I look yeah. at that stuff and I'm thinking, like, you times that to a martial arts. There's only martial arts that don't know where they come from. Uh, I can talk to a practitioner. I probably know about his, more about his history than he has. And and I'm just going. And come on, that's a shame. You know. And uh, because it, I have a I have a great respect for practitioners, and uh, what you're doing on the on this is very good because what you're doing Thank is you. getting people aware of other things. But I just hope that it gets across to people to where hey, you got to study. That's why that's why uh, with Terry, uh, he's got to make sure he gets a hold of Bill. To make sure that that stuff gets recorded. I always keep pushing on Bill Wallace. You know? Yeah, I'll 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 let you make that push. I'm I'm not there. <laughs> oh, I said, hey, you can do it now, Terry. Just you know, Terry's coming to the gathering. Uh, I said, Terry, he said, you know, he said my kids, I can still get them there, but he said, I can't, you know, because of the kidney thing. Said, That's right. right, Terry. I'm going to have you kick a bunch of magic guys. I got. 
It'll be fine. <laughs> oh, he's such a good man. Now, oh, let's you know say, why he's a sweetie. Yeah, go ahead. Let's say we've got somebody listening and, and you've convinced them how important history is and maybe they're feeling a little overwhelmed saying, where do I start? Now, of course, I'm going to suggest that they go back and they listen to all the episodes of this show from the beginning because there's so much that gets mixed in, uh, especially with with some of the folks that have been around. I mean, people that have been training for 30, 40, 50 years. But beyond that, are, are there any books that you would encourage oh. people to pick up? Well, you know, I just I just started a, if they look, uh, if they want to, try to look me up on the internet. I also have a, and I don't even, <laughs> you have to find it. I have a web thing going now. It's uh, for distant learning. And it has everything to do with mm-hmm. movement, the technique, the history. But they, what they want to do, and, you know, if, if you wanted to put it out, you give my phone number. I'll tell them who to go to. But, like, you're on the East Coast. There's a lot of history on the East Coast. You got, uh, in the Kemper world, you had Nick Serio did it, so much stuff. Yeah, I mean, his influence is, is still yeah. felt sure. today. Nick Serio and I became very good friends. Very close. And uh, Professor Serio, and then you had, uh, of course, he studied from a guy named George Pizarre. I think Nick did more for uh, the Kemper at that time than, than him. But you have, like, I mean, uh, up north in the, the uh, Japanese arts or whatever, he had, he had another pioneer uh, there named Peter Urban, uh, Okinawan yep. Gojuru. Okay, you yep. have uh, a lot of guys. Uh, Ronald Duncan is, was actually the very first ninja uh, in this country. And he's gone now. So you, you got a lot of pioneers out there these guys could work with. Uh, there's a there's a gentleman that comes out to my event each year. He's coming out this year. Uh, Rudy Duncan. You know Rudy? I don't. Oh, Rudy goes to the mm-hmm. uh, thing every year. And Rudy and I have become very good friends. But Rudy uh, is very open-minded. I, I, and uh, if I'm doing a clinic, he'll show up. He's been around a long time. And so there's a lot of history that took place in places like New York. Uh, up in the New England states, like I said, a lot of stuff. Professor Serio, you had Valari, and Valari came from Serio. <clears throat> um, but you got uh, all that stuff. But you got to ask the right people and uh, talk about history. Uh, the people from the, uh, the, the if, if I can help them out, I'd be more than happy to. But have them do their research. And it's not that hard. I mean, my God, today you got internet. Right, where I got yeah. my research in uh, the, the Kempo Arts after meeting with Temple, uh, after meeting with Tosi, I had to fly back and forth to Hawaii, fly all over the country, and I did that. And I literally met most of the Kempo systems. There's close to 200 and some odd systems of Kempo that started from the Tosi, and these guys don't know about each other. I can go someplace logistically. Uh, if I go to Arizona and I see a guy that does Kempo, he says, oh, I do Kempo. I says, uh, do you do boxer set? Advanced boxer? Yeah, okay. Well, you come from Tom Connors. as part of Traco organization. That's more dominant in that area. Or you go to Ohio. I do Kempo. Okay, well, if you do short one, short three, yeah, okay. You came from J.T. Will. Or a guy says something else that's never heard of before. Oh, it's Rod Sarkanowski. He just made up Kempo systems. Or... That he is, um, God, who's the other guy that was back there? Anyway, so there's all these different styles, and people don't even know where they come from. It's kind of crazy. Uh, Tracy's sure. organization did a lot of stuff. You know? um, so, yeah, I mean, it, do, it doesn't take that long because one road leads to the next. But you got to always be willing to accept that maybe your views or the views of your teacher might not be correct. When I saw Thomas Young, you know, I, I could have gone there and Thomas Young could have looked at me because I'd already been at Matosi had passed on and could look at me and said, you know, Bruce, everything you're doing is wrong. You know what I would have done? Accepted it and said, would you teach me? That's the problem with these guys. That's why they don't, they're, they're, they're scared to find out, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, it's not their view. Right. And it, and you can learn from other people's views, and it's all okay, you know. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. 
that, that's the neat Wait. thing about martial arts. It's just, you level up. You be nice, and, and you uh, enjoy the process, and be willing to say you're wrong. And students, you got to be willing to let your teacher be wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. It's called growth. You know? Yeah. Completely agree. Now, you've mentioned your gathering a few times, and this show is going to come out right about the same time, but I know it's an annual event. So spend a minute, tell tell people what you've got going on and how they would learn more about it. Uh, well, the gathering, they can look up, uh, we have a we have a webpage, it's called uh, uh, collectivesociety.com. And you can look up the gathering, there's all kinds of photos from previous gatherings and previous teachers that were there. And since I started the gathering, Jerry, we've lost about 35 instructors. They passed on. Mm. Yeah. You talk history, you know, you're going to lose them. And, and, and the problem is now I'm looking around at this. And, you know, they look that up. People go to this gathering because it is a historical event. They get to work with several people. I mean, tons. I think each teacher is going to, each student is going to be able to work with 65 to 70 instructors from all over the world. Wow. And That's incredible. the best thing is, is, uh, oh, we have a banquet on, uh, and Terry does this. Uh, Terry got, I think, some of his ideas from me. Um, but I have a, a elaborate banquet, uh, and we get the lion dancing coming out from San Francisco. We got a lot of different people coming out. I, I stole a thing from Terry. I got the, the medieval fighters coming out this year. <laughs> and oh, those guys are cool. Well, that was kind of cool. I, I you, get this, you get these karate guys that think they can punch or something. <laughs> punch that armor, man. <laughs> that, that doesn't make you grow up. I don't know what will. But um, uh, yeah, the, the gathering sometimes started many years ago. And uh, I did it for the, the, the reason of history. And, uh, but you're working with uh, three or four or five instructors. Usually, you, I try to bring it down to three uh, for each class. This year, we got James Lee teaching alongside a Leo Fong. Leo's a pioneer of the arts. And they're going to be working on a, a lot of the original Bruce Lee stuff, okay? That was before what you see now. Everybody's claiming, oh, I know J.T. Lee. Eh, you might not, you know? And, um, Got that. Um, Roy Goldberg's coming out from the East Coast from New York. I do Aiki Jits. That's the uh, pre art to Aikido. So we got a lot of different teachers. Uh, Filipino artists, my God, we got a ton of them this year. Sarati Eskrima, Dosa Pais, Pakiti Tursi. We got all these different guys coming out. So I encourage these guys to work. We have knife flowing. Okay. And uh, got some people from Bujikan, that's uh, the ninjutsu. And so what, what happens with that, what I did last year to, to pick up the knife throwing class, because, I, you know, the one thing I don't like about martial artists is sometimes the ego goes and they start taking them. You don't take yourself seriously. So what I did last year, which was a really genius move, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back, I had a picture taken of my mug, and we made a whole bunch of copies. We put them up on a knife throwing target. <laughs> the students got to throw knives at me, <laughs> and I had little girls coming up saying, "Auntie, can I have your autograph on the picture I just stabbed?" <laughs> <laughs> sure, man. Now, if I, I can that. get, well, I think all these teachers should. You got to be able to do that, you know. Can't take yourself seriously. You're a martial artist. You know what that means? You never got a real job. <laughs> you know? You're like, go get a job. Otherwise, yeah, you can. You got to level it out because if you don't, uh, so the gathering is about that. The gathering people uh, come together and uh, they get to sit. They get to banquet. And they get to talk. They get to eat together. They get to spend time. I encourage people. Hey, you know what? This guy is. He's he's in his in his room. He's talking history. You know, this is after the event. So you have different martial artists rapping. Michael D. Alba comes up of Falun Do, which is a a Korean system based on uh, Joe Bang Lee. 
these guys all have history. I tell these guys, go talk to them, man. You know? And laugh about what they do. You know? And on my students, I'll say, hey, you guys don't come talk to me. Go talk to them. You know? Sure. And um, so that's that's why. That's why they should look up the gathering. And they, next year, it'll be the same weekend. Uh, it'll be the first weekend of October. It'll be at a place called the Lionscape. They can see all the photos of it. And uh, it's an elaborate, classy event. You know, there's always a film presentation. There's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a big deal. So, uh, awesome. yeah, I, I was a little bit worried about it. And uh, I checked with a hotel and everything's broken up. So <laughs> it should, be, it should well, be good. It sounds like a great event and, and one that I've heard is great from other people as well. So unfortunately I won't be able to make it this year, but, uh, I'm glad it's the first, it's that, that same weekend every year. Cause it's going on my calendar as soon as I'm done recording this with you for next year, for 2017. Oh yeah. You and enjoy this, it. Oh, and oh, you know, I, you, you know what you could do out, you know, like with what you do, what you could do out there. What's that? All I gotta do is give you a room, man. You know, you go up and show up at that room and you get one teacher after the other. And yeah. Oh, the, then, the, the then, episodes yeah. we'd get. Yeah, and, and too bad it's not visual because you can go out and do visual talks. Well, who knows what uh, happens in a year, right? Yeah. The well, show continues to grow. So, um, yeah. And of course, the, the information for that, for anybody that might be new to listening, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. It's where we'll have links to all the stuff that we've talked about today. And this has been great. And I'd like to ask that for, for just one more thing as we kind of fade sure. here, we always ask our guests for one piece of advice, some parting words of wisdom, if you will, for those that are listening. And what would yours be? Practice hard to practice harder to practice harder. And enjoy the process. And pay attention, not to yourself, but to the arts. That's the most important. Don't make it about you. Make it about the arts. And you know what that'll do? You will go far. You can tell that history is very important to Hanchi Chutnik. He knows where he came from, and he believes you should too. As important as punching and kicking is, that's how important knowing your lineage is to Hanchi, or at least that was my takeaway. It was a pleasure to have him on the show and connect many of the different stories we've already heard, as well as point us in the direction of some guests we'll be having on in the future. Thank you, Hanchi Chutnik, for your time. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find photos and links to everything we talked about, including some great photos and the link to his annual gathering. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, and our username is Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our sort of not-quite-secret Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, Behind the Scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or perhaps your instructor or someone else, head over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear that too. So fill out the form over on the website or hit us up on social media. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. And you know we're always asking for reviews. And that's because they help spread the word of the show, move us up in the rankings, help new people find us, and helps us grow so we can bring this show to more people. And that's really what this is all about for us. If you like what we're doing, this is really the best way to help iTunes, Stitcher, post something on your blog. Anything you do like that, we would really appreciate. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our awesome sparring boots. If you're a school owner or a team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. That's all for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>